Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce to you today's moderator. Um, Manuel Gomez is an associate professor of law here at FIU in the College of Law, where he regularly teaches courses on complex litigation, international arbitration law and society, and introduction to international comparative law. Professor Gomez also has law teaching experience at other universities, such as Stanford and Iowa, and at several Latin American and European universities, either as guest lecturer, speaker, or visiting professor. His research and teaching interests cover an array of international law topics, mainly with a Latin American focus. Professor Gomez has earned important awards and recognitions at FIU and elsewhere. Among the most recent are at FIU's um, inaugural uh, Mahariava Faculty Award and a Cyber Faculty Research Grant that was awarded by FIU's College of Business. So with that, I will turn it over to our moderator and I hope that you uh, participate uh, in a lively discussion and come back and join us every week. Professor Manuel Bowman. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for coming. And uh, I hope you came uh, not only for the food, but for, for the discussion as well. And, uh, and as, uh, as Eric said, I, I will be the moderator. But uh, using my prerogative as moderator, I will, I will speak for a few minutes before we have a discussion, uh, trying to introduce the topic. I'm assuming that not, not all of you are, are law students. Is anybody a law student here? No? Great. So I can give you some, some basic terminology and, and some basic concepts on, uh, on the Snowden uh, case. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what is it that, that it means uh, that someone requests uh, political asylum and what's going on. Um, all of you know who, or have seen pictures, you, uh, more precisely, all of you have seen that picture, right? Uh, it was all over the news a few months ago. Uh, this is an American citizen. His name is Edward Snowden, or Ed Snowden. And uh, the media has called him different things, from a whistleblower to dissident to a traitor or a spy. There's a case brought against him by the US government. Uh, for violation of the Espionage Act. So, so formally, he's been charged as a, as a spy, as someone who also stole government property of the United States. What happened is that Mr. Snowden used to work for federal agencies, and then he worked for uh, defense contractors, the, the latest one being Booz Allen and Hamilton, which is a company, a private company, that provides uh, services to the US government. And uh, when he was in that job, or in those jobs, he acquired information that the government said was classified information. Some of the information had to do with a surveillance program that the federal government had been working on for a few years uh, to gather intelligence in the war on terror. And that Mr. Snowden got to a point where he decided to, to release and to share that information with the media, starting a, in early this year, in January of 2013, he apparently contacted uh, a few journalists. Uh, uh, basically, there, there are two people who, who had been mentioned. One of them uh, is a journalist who had been producing documentaries on different issues having to do with freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Uh, so that happened between January and May. He was stationed in Hawaii. He had a job, a steady job, with the Booz Allen and Hamilton. Uh, in May, he took a leave from his job. He said he was going to seek uh, medical treatment. He, f he left Hawaii. He closed his apartment or his house. And uh, according to a real estate agency, he just moved out of it. Uh, and then he showed up in Hong Kong. Uh, when he was in Hong Kong, he had meetings with these journalists. And uh, the first face-to-face -face meeting, some of the earlier communications had taken place through some chat software, uh, encrypted ch chat software, because he was afraid that, that someone was going to tap into his uh, communications with, with these people. And uh, they met in person. And a few days later, some of the media uh, in Europe started uh, showing or revealing some of the documents, one of them a PowerPoint presentation that showed that the US government had been uh, working on a program on a, on a, on a program uh, to, 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 to gather information, private information from citizens, not only in the United States, but elsewhere. And this is an ongoing political scandal. Uh, just uh, yesterday and this morning, the news were reporting that 
that some of this, um, some of this, uh, some of this uh, surveillance had been done even on, on foreign presidents, including the president of Brazil. So I have a video that, actually one of the two videos that, uh, that contains an interview that Mr. Snowden gave, and I want to show you probably four or five minutes of this video so you can, you can hear for yourselves what is it that he said, and there should be, oh. I don't know if there's a separate one. Oh, let's see. <coughs> if not, we can. I don't know if this. Yeah, there's not. You can probably. Uh, my name's Ed Snowden. I'm uh, no. nine years Wait. old. Wait a sec, we're going to see if we have, oh, here it is. Sorry about that. Can you enable it? No? What are some of the positions that you held previously? Uh, my name is Ed. I'm going to watch the first four or five minutes of it. Uh, my name is Ed Snowden. I'm uh, 29 years old. I work for Booz Allen Hamilton as an infrastructure analyst for NSA uh, in Hawaii. And what are some of the positions that you held previously with the intelligence community? Uh, I've been uh, a systems engineer. Those individuals are the people that I was referring to earlier. Those are the journalists that he offered information to. And this is one of the interviews. They videotaped uh, the interviews. He's an administrator. Uh, Senior advisor uh, for the uh, Central Intelligence Agency Solutions Consultant and a uh, Telecommunications Information Systems Officer. What are these people are going to be most interested in in, in in trying to understand what who you are and, and what you're thinking is the key at some point in time when you cross this line of thinking about being a whistleblower um, to making the choice to actually become a whistleblower. Walk people through that decision-making process. Uh, when you're in positions of, of privileged access, like a, a systems administrator for these sort of intelligence community agencies, you're exposed to a lot more information on a broader scale than the average employee. And because of that, you see things that uh, may be disturbing, but uh, over the course of a normal person's career, you'd only see one or two of these instances. Uh, when you see everything, you see them on a more frequent basis, and you recognize that some of these things are actually abuses. And when you talk to people about them, uh, in a place like this, where this is the, the normal state of business, people tend not to take them very seriously and you know, move on from them. But over time, that awareness of wrongdoing sort of builds up, and you feel compelled to talk about it. And the more you talk about it, the more you're ignored, the more you're told it's not a problem. Until eventually you realize that uh, these things need to be determined by the public, not by somebody who's simply hired by the government. Talk a little bit about how the American surveillance state actually functions. It, uh, does it target the actions of Americans? Uh, NSA, the intelligence community in general, uh, is focused on getting intelligence wherever it can, by any means possible, that it believes on the grounds of sort of self-certification that they serve the national interest. Uh, originally, we saw that uh, focus very narrowly tailored as foreign intelligence uh, gathered overseas. Now, increasingly, we see that it's happening domestically. And to do that, they, uh, the NSA specifically targets the communications of everyone. It ingests them by default. It collects them in its system, and it filters them, and it analyzes them, and it measures them, and it stores them for periods of time simply because that's the easiest, most efficient, and most valuable way to achieve these ends. So while they may uh, be intending to uh, target someone associated with a foreign government or someone that they suspect of terrorism, they're collecting your communications to do so. Uh, any analyst at any time can target anyone, uh, any selector anywhere. Where those uh, communications will be 
I think you get a flavor of it. I just wanted to, to give you a sense of what, what he had said because there is a lot of coverage in the news about what. Yes. Where's that uh, video? It was at the guard. It was uh, published by the Guardian in the UK. There's actually two, uh, so, so it's 12 minutes long, and I forget what how long the other one is. Right. You can you can watch the whole thing if you want. So those were leaked in June. He was in Hong Kong when the, those were leaked, and right after that. You know, the, the, it, it, go, it gets all over the place. You know, the, the U.S. government reacts saying this is classified information. He was in possession of classified information. Moreover, some of the documents that he leaked because then a, a batch of documents were also released. And I think that you, some of those you can, you can still find on the Internet. There was a PowerPoint presentation of what had been given at the Department of Defense uh, showing how the system, how this, this program worked. Uh, so the U.S. government said, there are two problems here. Number one is that he is indeed a spy of the government because he was working uh, and during his work uh, he possessed, he acquired information that is, is, a, is critical information for the government and, uh, and the release of that information goes against the national interest of the United States. And number two, the fact that he possessed and then he distributed all those, all those documents means that he, was, uh, he stole gov government's property. And then soon thereafter, the U.S. Uh, files a, a lawsuit, a complaint against him in federal courts in Virginia, and that case is ongoing, and uh, requests that, oh, so he, see he's in Hong Kong, and then he moves from Hong Kong to Russia, so he flies to Russia, and then there is this whole speculation that the, the flight to Russia was just a, a transit flight uh, for him to then go to fly to Cuba. Um, so WikiLeaks, and you have heard of, of WikiLeaks. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very prominent uh, group that has also has also been, been targeted the, for for this type of exposures. Uh, the the founder of WikiLeaks is is currently um, uh, in the in the Ecuadorian uh, embassy in in London. But WikiLeaks then, this is what 23rd of June says, they have assisted Mr. Snowden's political asylum in a democratic country, travel papers and safe exit, travel papers and safe exit from Hong Kong, more soon. This is June 23rd. So he had left Hong Kong, although the, gov the U.S. government had requested Hong Kong to arrest Mr. Snowden. There, there was an arrest warrant uh, against Mr. Snowden in the United States. And uh, the U.S. requires uh, requests, not requires requests, uh, Hong Kong to turn him over. So it's part of, of something called judicial cooperation. States, uh, different states, cooperate with each other in uh, in arresting people who are who are wanted for certain crimes. Uh, the authorities of Hong Kong declined to arrest him and let him go, uh, citing that there were some inconsistencies. They said. Uh, his name was not correctly spelled in the request, his passport number was not included, and things like that. Uh, then he lands into Russia, and uh, while in transit in Russia, uh, he learns that his U.S. passport has been revoked, meaning that he cannot travel around uh, with a passport because he doesn't have a valid passport. So, so myth number one, people had said, at some point that he had been, his citizenship had been revoked, that, that didn't happen. So his passport, his travel document had been revoked by the, by the U.S., but he's still a U.S. citizen. So weeks later, so he's, he stayed in that transit area of Moscow. There were some speculations. The New York Times had some uh, really interesting stories on, on uh, and you can look them up. Uh, not the article that, that we're going to talk about in a few minutes, but, but some other stories citing speculation. One, one really interesting that, that looked like a, like a scene from a movie. Uh, at some point, uh, people were saying that he was about to fly to Cuba. So all these journalists booked a ticket in that same flight. And it turned out that the flight was full of journalists from all over the world, but Snowden was nowhere to be seen. And, uh, um, and there's this particular writer who wrote this, this really interesting article on how he, he had to fly from Moscow to Havana and then back, uh, and what happened you know, in between the people wondering where is Snowden, where is Snowden, is he sitting here, is he sitting there, and Snowden was back in, in Moscow. So he finally gives a press release. You can, 
you can probably find that online as well, and uh, seeks political asylum in, in, in Russia. And this is the application. I don't think you can read it very well, but it doesn't really matter. It says, I hereby request your considering the possibility of granting to me temporary asylum on the Russian Federation. This is the Ju on July 15th. 2013. We're going to talk a little bit more about, in technical terms, what, what asylum means and, and all that. Then what happens after that is that the U.S. government, so the Attorney General of the U.S. of the United States, sends a, a few days later, a week later, sends a letter to the Minister of Justice of the Russian Federation telling him, I'm writing concerning the current status of Edward Snowden. As you know, Mr. Snowden has been charged with the theft of government property, what I told you a few minutes ago, unauthorized communication of national defense information, and willful communication of classified communications intelligence information to an unauthorized person. According to news reports and information provided by your, gov your government, Mr. Snowden is currently in the transit zone of the airport. We understand from press reports and prior conversations between our governments that Mr. Snowden believes that he's unable to travel out of Russia and must therefore take steps to legalize his status. This is due to the revocation of his passport. That is not accurate. He's able to travel. Despite the revocation of his passport, they had revoked his passport, Mr. Snowden, Snowden remains a U.S. citizen. He is eligible for a limited validity passport good for direct return to the United States. So the U.S. government says his passport is revoked. He can only come back to the United States. We'll let him in. The problem with a revoked passport is not that you, can't, you cannot leave a country. You can't leave a country. A country is free to let you go, but then you won't be able to enter into another country because you don't have a passport. The U.S. government is basically saying here he doesn't have a passport to use to go anywhere he wants, but he can come back. And we want him to come back. The U.S. is willing to immediately issue such a passport to Mr. Snowden. And then what comes later is that we also understand from press reports that Mr. Snowden has filed papers seeking temporary asylum in Russia, that, that uh, request that you saw, on the grounds that he, if he were returned to the United States, he would be tortured and would face the death penalty. And then they said these claims are without merit. And the, the, the letter has another, this communication had another page, basically indicating the assurances that the U.S. government would give the Russian Federation, and I'll tell you a little bit why uh, more uh, later, why is it that the U.S. government was giving assurances to Russia, and among the assurances they say he won't be tortured, he won't be face the death penalty, they provide their, the U.S. won't not, well, and then they will say later on what type of crimes he's, he's facing, that he's going to have the possibility of defending himself in court, and so on and so forth. What happens? Russia gives him asylum. Uh, this, is a, this is a picture of a temporary passport issued to her document, actually, issued to him by the Russian Federation, basically indicating that starting on July 31st of 2013, and for the period of one year, Mr. Edward Snowden could remain in the Russian Federation. So what is asylum? So first question that comes up is, what is asylum? People talk about asylum, political asylum, temporary asylum. What is it? So asylum is a, is a right that is established. It, it's, it's, really a, it's really an old, very, very old institution that, that entails the protection that someone seeks when that person is being persecuted. Persecuted, P-E-R, secuted. And there's a difference. Because he, because he, in the U.S., he's been prosecuted, P-R-O-secuted. And we're going to talk about the difference there. So there, is, there are different um, international <coughs> agreements that provide for the right to seek and enjoy asylum, not the right to asylum per se. And I'm going to tell you what, why I'm making the difference here. So first of all, asylum is, or the right to seek asylum, the right to request, to ask for it, is considered as a human right. There is an important convention. It's known as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's really a document that doesn't, if you violate it, so, so it contains, so, so no one should violate it. 
but there are no particular sanctions in that document, so it's a declaration. It's a document, it's a unilateral document that says these are fundamental rights that we think everybody should have. Regardless of whether your country signs onto this document, this declaration, this is a statement, a general statement that has been made that this is what the civilized community of the world thinks that is important. And Article 14 sa says that asylum, or the right to seek asylum, is a human right, is a fundamental right. Then there is a convention, and when we say convention, we're really talking about a contract, the type of con an agreement, an international agreement between different governments. And that convention, which by now has been subscribed by more than 140 countries around the world, is called, well, there, 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 there are several conventions called the U.S. Conventions relating to the status of refugees. And then there is a protocol, which is an additional document to that convention, that talks about the right to seek asylum. And then there are national laws. So each country has its own laws. Russia, when Russia gave Mr. Snowden asylum, when they told him, and this was explained in the article that you, that you have on your desks, uh, when they told him, you have temporary asylum, which means we grant you temporary residence in this country for one year, Russia was doing so in exercise of their own national laws. Each country has their own laws that provide for whether they grant asylum to certain categories of people, whether they have different types of asylum, and what are the implications, and what conditions, and so on and so forth. It's like the requirements. And that depends on each country. Each country is autonomous to decide how they do it, when they do it, and in which specific terms they do it. So there is the national level, all these laws, and then there is the international level, this convention, the Convention on, on Refugees. And then, because, and, and why is it called refugees? Because usually asylum is sought by people who are considered refugees. So Ed Snowden said, or he stated, that he was a refugee. And a refugee, to give you a sense of what is it that these conventions say about refugee, is any person who has a well-founded fear. It's not just that I'm afraid because, you know, I can't explain it, but I think I have a hunch that they're after me. But this is a well-founded fear. He says, I have, I owe this well-founded fear to being persecuted. That means someone's after me. For reasons of race, could be, for example, when there is a, a government that is going after people who are of this part or a particular race, and that has happened many times in the world, and those people or some members of that group flee the country and go somewhere else and say, if I go back, I'm going to be killed or imprisoned or tortured because of my race, sometimes because of religion, sometimes because of nationality. Let's go after people who are from country X, and there are plenty of examples, in, in, unfortunately, in many, in many countries. And then what I highlighted, what I underlined, is, is what people have said could apply to the Snowden case, membership to a, of a particular social group or political opinion. Someone who has a political opinion and has been persecuted, and persecution <coughs> means that you're, someone's going after you for no particular, well, for a reason, but that reason tends to be an illegitimate reason. Then if that person is outside the country of his nationality, and is unable or unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country. In this case, Mr. Snowden says, I'm an American citizen, but the laws, the U.S. is not going to protect me. In fact, the U.S. government is the one that's after me. And he's unable or unwilling, in, his, in this case, he was unwilling to return to the United States, stating that he had been persecuted. So remember when I started and I mentioned I used the word whistleblower. And uh, you know what a whistleblower is? Not in the literal sense. In the literal sense is someone who blows a whistle, right? But, but this is not the sense that ha the whistleblower has been used in the media in the last few years. A whistleblower is someone who gives, who let out, who lets out information that otherwise wouldn't be available. And it's a term that is not necessarily a negative term. People use it in the media 
to describe someone who exposes information that is harmful to a group, harmful to society. When factories, when we learn that factories have been using children, for example, the person who exposes that, the person who films with their camera and shows the world, this is what's happening in the factory of this particular type of shoes or particular type of electronics, that person is usually seen as a whistleblower, someone who blowed the whistle, someone who let the world know that this is going on. And that's generally seen as a positive thing. Because if you don't uncover those things, then people are going to be harmed. You had a question. Was there a reason, or was he explained why he decided to expose it? Well, later on, he says that, well, he said some of, some of it in the, in, the, in the segment that we watch. He says, you know, it gets to a point where you, where you complain to people, or you tell people who you work with. You know, he, he puts, puts it in, in, the, in a different person, than say, not saying, I spoke with someone. But he says, you know, it gets to a point where you talk to someone and they don't pay attention to you uh, and then you have to let the public decide. So that's his claim. And then he says, and so at some point later on, I had a very comfortable job. I was living in Hawaii, which is wonderful. And you wonder, why is it that I did this? Because they asked him, said, what do you do it? You're 29, so what do you think is going to happen to you? You know, you have a, a, the, your whole life is ahead of you. He says, well, because you know, it's for the common good, it's for society, and so on and so forth. That's not what the government says. Anyways, so the term, so the government doesn't call him a whistleblower. They said, no, he's not a positive person. He is a person who's a spy. He's someone who sold government, gave government property. We don't care about his purposes. These, are, these are purposes are, this action constitutes a crime, period. So he says, or, or, or the, the speculation was, was that as a whistleblower, someone who's exposing any information that, if guarded, is harmful, information that if continues to be protected is harmful to society, could be thought as being part of a social group. Remember that political asylum could be granted to people who are part of a social group who's persecuted. And the argument would be the US government is persecuting people who are part of the groups of whistleblowers. But then the counter argument to that would be that, well, there is no social group of whistleblowers. You know, whistleblowers are people who tend to appear individually, so you cannot categorize them all. And then some other people say, well, he's being persecuted in account of his political opinion, because that is a political opinion. But then the counter argument to that would be, well, this isn't a really political opinion. He's not stating anything politically aside from his just saying, this is information that is out. He's not saying, well, he is in a way saying the government is doing something wrong. Uh, and if that's political, then it would be for the country where he's applying to asylum to, to value or to determine whether that is, is, a, is, a, is so, a sufficient cause for him to get asylum. There is a case, uh, this case, Baghdad Sar Sarian versus Holder. Holder is Eric Holder, the, the Attorney General. It's a 2010 case of an Armenian citizen in the U.S. who had exposed uh, corruption practices in Armenia and then flew to the United States, sought asylum, and the U.S. said, to, just to give you a flavor of how the U.S. views asylum in general, the U.S. said, we will grant you asylum because the fact that you exposed all that and, uh, and it's of political nature put you in that position of someone who's politically persecuted and you would deserve asylum. And then there's this different betu difference between persecution and, and prosecution. And prosecution is the indictment, which is a formal legal term, for the revelation of classified information. And it's not necessarily a form of persecuting someone going after someone. He's going after someone, but formally. From the standpoint of the United States, this gentleman committed a crime. And they said, this is not a political statement. He committed a crime, and he should be uh, tried for the crime that he committed. And then this is the last slide, and then I want to have a little uh, video. How long do we have? I forgot. OK, OK, we have plenty of time. This won't take more than probably five, 10 minutes. And then the, the issue that is really important here for you to know is that 
what the U.S. wanted at the beginning, when they requested that Hong Kong turn him over or kick him out of the country, and then when they asked Russia to send him back to the United States, they wanted him to be deported. And you've heard this term before, I'm sure. I hope none of you has been deported ever, or will be deported. But deportation is essentially that someone, the, the, the action by which someone is expelled from a particular country. Countries, according to their own law, might have some, some uh, regulations, or will always have some regulations and some rules on, on what uh, warrants someone uh, to be deported. In the U.S., for example, if you're a tourist and you overstay your tourist visa, you're subject to deportation. That means that you're going to be sent back to your country. There is another term that is called extradition. And extradition is the surrender of persons who have committed crimes in a, in a foreign country. For example, someone who's committed a crime in the United States and flees the United States and goes to Spain. And the government of the United States has initiated, or someone has initiated an action, usually a criminal action against that person, then there are some international agreements between countries that provide for the surrender of that person in that country. This is usually uh, in the realm of something called judicial cooperation, which is assistance or assistance, judicial assistance. So the U.S. and Spain may have a treaty, an agreement, by which they agree or they have promised to each other that if there's someone who's been sought by the U.S., for example, and that person finds himself in the territory of Spain, that there will be a legal process by which that person will be detained in Spain and sent back to the United States. And that's what's called extradition. It's a legal process. Yes? Um, what's, what's the difference between extradition and what's called, um, I don't remember what it is, red line or red tape? Well, red tape is usually a term to describe bureaucracies and, and uh, but extradition is a legal process. So extradition is a legal process, whereas deportation is usually an administrative process that doesn't involve any, any legal, the, the, any, the triggering of any legal mechanisms or courts or anything. It could, but usually it doesn't. So what happens? The U.S. has agreements with many states around the world that are called extradition treaties. They're usually treaties with just one single state. And then, so the interesting thing here, which is that the U.S. does not have an extradition treaty with Russia. That explains to you why Mr. Snowden is in Russia. Because he went to a country where that didn't have an extradition treaty with the United States. He does have extradition treaty. Uh, the U.S. does have extradition treaties with three other countries that had offered Mr. Snowden asylum before Russia did. So he was in Russia, and while he was in Russia, the Venezuelan president announced, we are offering Mr. Snowden political asylum. He can come here. Mr. Snowden had a little problem. How does he get to Venezuela? Venezuela said, you can come here, and if you come here, we'll give you political asylum. Then the problem is that Venezuela has a, an extradition treaty with the United States. There is a, it's, it's, a, it's a little complicated. The, the, probably Venezuela would drag its feet, you know, because it's a political thing. Extradition treaties usually exclude political crimes, but the consideration of whether a crime is political or not depends on Venezuela's interpretation. Then Bolivia also offered asylum, and Nicaragua also offered asylum, and those three countries have extradition treaties with the United States. Political offenses are generally excluded from this regime of extradition, but uh, the definition, again, depends on what the country, the courts of Venezuela or Bolivia or Nicaragua would say about uh, the, that alleged crime being an, a crime that is of political nature. And then finally, and, uh, and then we'll, we can talk a little bit about, about the, 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 what's, mis what's going on with Mr. Snowden now, <laughs> Asylum is that protection. Russia offered Mr. Snowden 
that protection for a year. They said, temporarily, we're going to offer you protection. They subjected that, that protection to certain conditions. And uh, the main condition that we know of, there might be a document that is not, that never uh, made it to the media or, or we don't know, uh, that said the, the main condition was that he did not engage in political activity or in doing, in, the, in engaging in any work and this is now the article of the New York Times that you read for today, aimed at inflicting damage on our American partners. This is what Mr. Putin said. The, the President of Russia said, we will grant him asylum if he agrees not to work in any way against the interests of the United States. So what does it tell you? Number one, the political asylum is a unilateral declaration of Russia. The Russian government gives it. In the, it, they have to explain no one else, not even the United States, they're not accountable to the United States for why is it that they gave asylum to this individual. The U.S. was in disagreement with it. That created a little bit of a political crisis, but Russia is not, doesn't have to answer to anyone whether they want it. It's like you don't have to answer to anyone whether you told a, a friend of yours to stay in your house. It's a, it's, a, it's a way of, of looking at it in a, simple, in a simple fashion. The problem is that because it's a prerogative of the Russian government to provide or to grant asylum, they can also revoke it any time. Tomorrow, if Mr. Snowden gives some uh, interview or if the Russian government thinks that Mr. Snowden has jeopardized it or has violated the the terms of the agreement, they could say, you know what, your asylum is revoked, you have to leave. We'll give you X number of days for you to go somewhere else. The problem with the asylum that had been offered to him by Nicaragua, Bolivia, and Venezuela is that those, if, well, first they offered the asylum, he had to accept the offer, and then they would probably negotiate on the terms, is that any of those countries, although highly unlikely because of the political scenario could have revoked the asylum and then uh, and then process an extradition request if the US uh, filed an extradition request and that would be pretty bad for him so that's probably a reason for him to stay away from those countries although those countries uh, had offered him asylum so that is in a in a half an hour or so what the status of this case is the article that I recommended for you to read, uh, the title is Leaker Files for Asylum to Remain in Russia. It describes the process of, of asylum. It talks about the US putting pressure on Russia and then Russia finally granting him asylum and, uh, and talking a little bit about the case and the US case, you know, the, 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 the crimes that he had been charged uh, for with and, and so on and so forth. So I'm more than happy to, to talk more about this, or, but I would like to hear from you first. Anybody has a reaction or questions, comments? Yes? Why do you think some people consider him a hero? A what, sorry? Why do you think some people consider him a hero? Oh, some people consider him a hero. That, that's right. So some people labeled him. I've, uh, I, I just put some of the, of, the, of, the, of the main labels that were given to him, but some people say he's a hero. And some people say he's a hero because they, they said, well, some, for someone to, to take the risk. So heroism is usually attached or, or associated with a, a great risk to the person or to the individual. They say he, took, he undertook this huge risk, you know, risking his own life, he, risking his entire life. From now on, he will be on the run. You know, Russia gave him that for a year. Uh, they would probably grant it for him for another year, but you know, when you're 30, when you're 29, 30, having to not being able to go back to your country, and because the U.S. is not going to drop the charges anytime soon, or it doesn't look like it would, uh, even if a government, the government changes, you know, this is a pretty serious uh, crime. Having to renew your your status every year and not knowing if they're going to give it to you again is a, is definitely a risk. So I think that's that's why some people said, well. If people exposes this type of government behavior more and more and more, you know, the, the world is going to be probably better because governments are going to are going to be very careful. We're going to stop doing it. Oh, sorry, I, it's just I have a.
question on a, like a similar line. Um, I mean, um, 40 years ago, for example, um, the uh, Watergate scandal, the exposure of states, uh, state secrets was really <coughs> well received in U.S. society and in international politics as well. But uh, today, for example, you know Julian Assange and um, Snowden. I mean, it's. Um, I mean, in the past, for example, it, uh, it led to the Nixon uh, administration to resign. But you know, today, you know, the people who've actually exposed, uh, I guess, crimes or secrets are being treated like criminals are considered to be criminals. So, what's the difference? What's changed in the past four years? Are, and the and are the crimes different in nature? Well, one of them, the many things change, and one of them uh, has to do with media. Perhaps the main change has to do with with media, with the the, the speed by which media travels. You know, the, the main possibility of us uh, being able to watch that video as it came out in, in, in June, everybody, the world was able to, to watch that. The world was able to see the documents. None of those documents that were, that were leaked during the scandal uh, that led to Watergate were public you know, in, in, this, in the way that they are today. So people knew there had been a scandal. It was largely a domestic scandal. So that's another difference between that and this. This is not just a domestic scandal. This is an, an international scandal. This is, this is a, a practice of a government that affects, arguably, affects other governments. And that's probably the hook uh, to, to get some other governments interested in this story to, by telling them this is not about the, government, the U.S. government spying on U.S. citizens. This is about the U.S. government spying on you. It did it to you as well. So how do you react to that? And that's a way to to get someone else involved and say, oh, I don't want that. That's, that's, not, that's not right. That's one dimension of it. But then the other dimension of it, which is what the government has advocated here over and over, is that the government here has said, this is in a right. This is in a right. Well, it has, the government has been put in a very difficult position because uh, the mere fact that, that, a, that a government program has been exposed like that, you know, even having the slides that were used in the presentations, is, uh, is, is pretty concerning if you, are, if you are a government official, but the government has said, in a way, has justified the existence of the program by saying the purpose of that program was not to spy on anyone, was not just to be the, act as the big brother uh, of all the citizens, but to track terrorists and to track and to pre prevent um, the commission of, of bigger crimes. Assange, on the other hand, when you, you were asking about WikiLeaks, the big difference is, is media, too. WikiLeaks is a constant source of, of, uh, of information, uh, which creates, which to so some people is, is good because they say, well, all this information is out there. To other people, it's not good because they say, well, even if I'm not in favor of the government, uh, some, most of the times you don't know the source of that information. Uh, it could be it could be fake information. It could be real information, but but sought by enemies of the government, and uh, there might have uh, spurred this is, or created incentives for people to steal information from the government and then sell it uh, to to some media outlet. So so in the it, it's a very complicated picture. You know that it might have because we are all interested in 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 getting information and we think we have a right. And what made it difficult for the U.S. government here in this particular case is that there was a big popular outrage. People were not happy about this. The, the, the popularity of this type of program was very low. The government was trying to defend it, but citizens in general were, were really upset at it. And even the technology companies such as Google and Microsoft have been trying to ask the government uh, Please let us share what we're doing because we don't want our clients or our customers to flee or go somewhere else uh, thinking that we're spying on them. We're not. You know, we were forced by the government to share some information. And uh, if this is really a, a legitimate program, you know, we would like to tell more and more. So there's a lot of pressure all over the place. I, I saw the ha hand there first. Um, my question is concerning the recent revelations that of the the Pfizer court that revealed the court rulings that um, the NSA has not been following its internal protocols for the, this program mass surveillance that uh, Snowden has uncovered. So 
have you read any of those decisions recently? Yes, yes. So, so the problem, and that's a, well, that's a, that's a, 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 a somewhat related but a separate, and, and that should probably be the, the subject of another, of another round table here. Um, what Snowden uncovered the existence of this program, but then people were wondering how, it, how does it work? How do you get Google and all those technology companies? Because in the PowerPoint presentation, there were the, the lists of all the, tech, all the companies we know, all the companies we use, Skype, Google, et cetera, et cetera. And then the question was, how is it that they lend themselves to do this? They betrayed us. And then the company said, we didn't betray anyone. We were following court orders. And then people asked, which courts? I haven't seen any court requesting for that. Well, guess what? There were some secret courts. There were, as part of this national security program, some courts were created in order to deal with this. Everything was confidential. Oh, sorry. Everything was confidential in these court proceedings. And then that led to the, that opened this, this can of worms, if, if we were to call it something. Uh, there's not really appropriate, but you know, you, you get it. Uh, is, uh, is that it created all these questions about uh, whether this is appropriate, whether this goes against the rule of law. You know, the U.S. Uh, prides itself for, for protecting the rights of citizens, but here you have like a double standard. You have the courts for everyone, and then you have the secret courts where we don't even know what's going on there. So that's, that's on right now. Um, okay, about the comparison of Watergate, is it any different though? Because over there, like they were breaking in and they're trying to close something up, whereas this, they, yeah, they may be doing they may be breaking the law, but they're doing it through you know, official government programs. Well, he was. He, he woke, so, so if you read the if you if you read the complaint, but it's very technical. It's 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 a, it's publicly available. The the complaint is the, the lawsuit that the government filed against Mr. Snowden. Uh, they described how the, the acquisition and the release of that information. They said that's he stole government's property. In Watergate, they were not necessarily uh, they were not necessarily stealing government's property, but they're recording. Uh, people's conversations and so on and so forth. So it's a, there's it's a slightly different, different conducts, but uh, leading to or they're similar in the sense that someone is a, is getting information from someone else without that person consenting to it. And uh, as far as like, you know, the actual information uh, that was released, which I don't know if it's the subject of this, how would you know if there is some wrongdoing by the government, then how would he, how should he have it exposed or or should we not have heard about it? Well, that's a, that's a big question that some people say, uh, some people who, who some, so even some groups of lawyers have said there is a possibility to act upon that information uh, against the government because that has exposed some wrongdoings by the government. I'm, I'm not aware, I haven't seen the documents and I'm, I'm not an expert on that, but that might be, that might lead to other lawsuits or other uh, judicial actions against the, gov against the government. Certainly WikiLeaks has given ammunition to, to a lot of people all over the world to not only to know, it's not just, it's, it's not just acquiring information and using it as a gossip, saying, oh, you see, now I can tell that the U.S. Embassy in, in, in Paris was throwing these parties, which is also part of a information that WikiLeaks has released, but now I can see that there had been bribes or there had been crimes committed, and, and you can action upon that. Well, I think most of the story, that's a very interesting comment because uh, most of the story, you know, the more it focused on Snowden and the less it focused on the actual programs was probably better for those who were interested in keeping the program alive because, you know, the more you talk about this guy, the more you don't call him whistleblower. Actually, some, some newspapers uh, call them, and this is really interesting, call him different things. Uh, the article that I gave you says leaker, someone who leaks information. Uh, whistleblower is usually attached to this idea of being the Robin Hood, you know, someone who's, who's letting everybody exposing some harm. But when you say he leaked information, it could be a bad thing too. And some other media outlets call them different things. And some said 
you know, the, the spy, the American spy, and so on and so forth. So keeping the story focused on that uh, div diverts from, from, from the other side. Uh, I don't think the program has shut down. In fact, what the government has said is that the program is justified, and because it's secret, you know, we don't really know what's going on. Uh, now the latest thing is that Google and some other technology companies, I think Microsoft is another one, has requested the court that ordered them to give all this information or to participate in the program authorization to disclose, to tell the customers uh, of those, of the, or the business, you know, partners of those companies, why, what's their involvement in it? So there is a lot of pressure from the industry too. And that's interesting. We don't know what's going to happen there. Let's take one more question, and then we'll one from there, and then yours. You close with you. Uh, if I remember correctly, I do remember that I think Snowden also, uh, on top of the Prism project, uh, there were several other hundred files that he was able to yeah. uh, take out of Hawaii and essentially run to Hong Kong, which is China, right. and then Russia later, which are the United States' two leading adversaries. Mm -hmm. Now. I'm not exactly sure like why he chose those two particular countries if he didn't want to be labeled as a spy, but do you know maybe why in particular he chose to go to those two countries um, if, unless he wanted to profit from it instead of going straight to Nicaragua or doing something like what WikiLeaks did? Right, well going straight to Nicaragua, you, you, so first of all, you know, it's, it's impossible to know what was going on. You know, my first reaction when I saw him was like, really, this is, so, so you think in terms of being, you know, all this aside, you know, you're 29, uh, it doesn't, it didn't really, it really, really looked like he had a plan because it was all, it appeared to be all randomly. Uh, you know, so you, you go to Hong Kong, I think that that was planned to go to Hong Kong, but then in Russia, spending three weeks at an airport's transit authority, he filed, he filed for asylum with like 15 different countries in one, in one week, and they all said no or didn't reply, and then six more. So when you have to file 20, more than 21 uh, asylum applications and, uh, and most of them deny it, it doesn't look like you had pre-negotiated with, with countries, and uh, China didn't offer him asylum. Russia took a long time to offer him asylum, more than a month. So, so that shows that even though Russia could profit, you know, from, from this information, uh, it's, it's too big of a political problem to, because Russia then didn't want to encourage someone else to do it against Russia. So the, the, the political problem that Russia has with someone like that, and, and this is the, what the U.S. government is telling Russia, saying you're harboring this guy and you're encouraging this type of industry. What I, what I said at the beginning when, when you asked about Watergate and I said this, the problem with this is that it encourages, it might be seen as to encourage uh, you know, people to get information because there's just a market for it. Uh, so that's, that's what makes it a problem. So I don't know how well planned it was. There are, of course, all these theories that say, no, he was planned from the beginning. Uh, Assange offered him his political, his legal advisors to help him out. In fact, you saw one of the slides that I showed you from WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks is the, is the organization in their Twitter account that says they are assisting Mr. Snowden's it, Mr. Snowden in securing political asi asylum. But not even Assange had it easy. Assange ran all over the place and finally got to Ecuador and he's stranded in, a, in the Ecuadorian ambassador in London without being able to go anywhere. So, so it's a complicated thing. I don't think there are assurances given to people. One interesting thing that happened is that when uh, Snowden claimed that he was afraid of, uh, he, he was in fear for his life. Uh, someone released, uh, 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 there was a tweet and then there was some, some information released saying there are hundreds of other documents and if anything happens to him, you know like in the movies, if anything happens to me, all these documents are going to be released right away. And Assange has, has uh, given a similar threat to the world and no one knows. No one has done anything to them. And that might be some of the assurances that they, that they seek. You said one of the formal charges is espionage. Yeah. So I wanted to, to talk about that word. I've heard some people in the media say because he didn't give this information to a specific enemy, but he just let it out there, that that's not necessarily what espionage is. And other people have said, well, because our specific enemies could get it because it's out there, it is espionage. I was wondering if you right. have any insight into it. Well, the, the, the answer, right. So, so we don't know for sure what really happened. 
But then the US government says, that's exactly what the trial is for. They said, we are not saying that he, he's not, he hasn't been declared by a court as someone who, is, who has done this or that. But this is exactly what the trial is for, which takes us back full circle to this difference between persecution, being persecuted, being someone's after you for no reason, well, for re a reason, but it's an, it's an evil reason, it's an illegitimate reason, and prosecution, which is there is a formal charge against you. You will, be, you will have the right to defend yourselves. You'll have the right to a lawyer. The, the Attorney General of the United States, in the second page of that letter, which I didn't show you the second page because I didn't think you know, we should focus on the letter, uh, the second page says, he won't be, well, here it says, he won't be tried, he won't be tortured, uh, he won't be given the death penalty. The complaint that the U.S. filed has, and, and this is said in your article, says, it charged, this is the second page of your article, punishable by up to 10 years in prison for a total of 30 years. That's what the U.S. government says so far. They said, this is just 30 years in prison. And we're not saying that he got it. He has to defend himself, and he might walk free. But then towards the end, that same article that you read, and we'll end with this, but Mr. Snowden and his supporters in and outside Russia had cited the existence of the death penalty in the United States, uh, noting that American officials have said he could face additional charges. Nothing prevents the U.S. from filing more charges against Mr. Snowden once he's here. So, so far they have said, well, this is only 30 years. Of course, he doesn't believe it because, number one, it could be really 30 years and, and it would be, you know, he doesn't want to be locked up for 30 years. And, uh, but number two, it could be that they file, which is highly likely, they file additional charges and it ends up being not 30 years, but 100 and some years or anything. That is, that is really a, something that's going to put him in a, in a really bad position. Anyways, so right on time. Thank you very much for coming, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions in private.